Welcome all of you to this live program at Authentic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Professor Karl Heinz Frosch from Hamburg, Germany. Professor Frosch is the director of the Orthopedic and Trauma Department at the University Medical Center in Hamburg, Eppendorf, in Germany. He's also the medical director at the BG Hospital in Hamburg, Bergdorf, Germany. Professor Frosch, area of interest is knee dislocations, fractures and ligament injuries around the knee, arthroscopic techniques for PLC reconstruction and osteotomies of the knee. Professor Frosch has been the past president of the German Knee Society, he has been the chairman of the trauma committee of the AGA, and has been actively involved in AO trauma and the ESCA Knee Committee. Professor Frosch is well known for the approach that bears his name, the Frosch approach for tibial plateau fractures. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Professor Karl Heinz Frosch from Hamburg, Germany. Over to you, Professor. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. Great honor for me um, to be here and um, to give a presentation about probably my favorite topic, which is, which is um, post-lateral tibial plateau fractures. <laughs> so let me start um, with the presentation. I have two main topics. The first topic is um, simple postlateral impression fractures. And the second one is more complex postlateral fractures. And usually simple fractures can be done arthroscopically, arthroscopic treatment, more complex fractures need open surgery. And both I will address today and will show you the approaches and our concept to treat this kind of fractures. Let's start with the more simple or um, less complex fractures. Most of these fractures occur during ACL rupture when the, the lateral femoral condyle hits the posterolateral aspect of the tibial plateau. And then we very often, it's around 8% um, of, the, of, of all ACL injuries um, have an impression fracture, not only an edema, it's an impression fracture. They not all need surgery, but we see this in our department around 8%. <clears throat> what, um, diagnostic, <clears throat> excuse me. what diagnostic do we need um, in this kind of fracture? We usually do an MRI, but as you see in this picture, <clears throat> the MRI does not show very much impression at the postlateral corner. This is the same patient. In the same patient, we did a CT scan and we saw that there is a significant postlateral impression of the postlateral um, tibial plateau. So in most cases, if there is a significant fracture, we strongly recommend to do an additional CT scan. And we call this also kind of apple bite fracture because this looks like an apple bite in the axial CT scan. Let me start with a case example, which <clears throat> might illustrate um, the importance of the postlateral tibial plateau. This is a 47 year old patient with an ACL rupture, and she had a postlateral tibial plateau impression fracture. So this was treated by myself some years ago. And what I did, it, I did a conservative treatment of the postlateral tibial plateau. And after um, some weeks, I think eight weeks later, we did, I did an ACL reconstruction, as you see um, here. Then, then some months later, the patient came back. She had a stable knee. She had a negative Lachman test. It was very stable. Lachman test was really stable. But she had a grossly positive pivot shift test. So that was the first time many years ago where I realized that we can have patients with a negative Lachman test, stable ACL, and a positive pivot shift. And I did not fully understand the problem. So this is already during surgery. You see this is on the right side is the femur, the tibia. And now you see I do a pivot shift, and you see how the lateral femur condyle slips down the tibial plateau. Now, do you see this? It nicely slips down the tibial plateau to the postulator side. It's kind of a locking mechanism. So this is a bony pivot shift because of a postulateral impression fracture. So when we did an intraarticular osteotomy and elevated the postulator tibial plateau, it was around um, eight millimeters. 
<clears throat> you can see now the intraoperative um, pivot shift. We elevated just the posterolateral tibial plateau and the pivot shift was gone. So this is a bony pivot shift. And this illustri illustrated very nicely the supportance of the posterolateral tibial plateau, even if, it's, if there are small depressions in ACL ruptures, for example. This is a second case which nicely illustrates, in my opinion, the importance of the posterolateral tibial plateau. This is a female, 15-year-old um, female with a third, third rupture of the ACL, plus she had a posterolateral rim impression. And if you see the CT scan, you see uh, it's almost a, a luxated or subluxated femoral condyle on the tibial plateau. So this was also a patient who suffered from positive pivot shift and the ACL graft step-by-step step, um, deteriorated or ruptured step-by-step step and um, got insufficient. So he had a grossly positive pivot shift and in this case also a positive Lachmann test because the ACL was ruptured the third time. So what we did is we elevated the posterolateral tibial plateau with a posterolateral osteotomy. We osteotomized the whole posterolateral quadrant and this is about one centimeter of bone, um, which was additionally pu pushed up. And so um, she had a posterolateral tibial plateau again. And now take a look at the CT scan. You don't see the, the subluxation anymore. And the patient at once felt much better. Even she had still an unstable knee. And some months later, we did additionally the ACL. And um, it was um, patient this was four years ago, and patient is doing um, very well now. We classified um, this posterolateral impression fractures in a publication. And when should we do surgery? We know from multiple publications, especially one um, biomechanical publication, that if the depression in the sagittal view of the MRI um, is more than 50% of the meniscus, or otherwise, if the meniscus, more than 50% of the meniscus are not supported by the posterolateral tibial plateau, and the depression is more than two millimeters, more than two millimeters, then we have, um, we think that it might be, it might be indicated to do a posterolateral elevation. This is usually the case how we see this, 46 years old, posterolateral impression. And if the meniscus, the lateral meniscus, and we see this also in the MRI here, the uh, in the CT scan, the lateral meniscus is not fully supported. So we think it's worth to elevate it. This can be done arthroscopically. We have a special device here um, with, a, with a cannulated um, REM, um, cannulated angled REM, as you see here. So we can elevate the posterolateral corner. This is the arthroscopic um, view. We elevate it, and then with um, two wires, you see this in the right pictures. Um, this is a cannulated REM, and two K wires are placed, and we put in two or three cannulated um, screws and fix the fragment, as you see here. And also intraoperatively, you see now the posterolateral tibia plateau again, and the meniscus is supported. If it's more complex, you also can put the arthroscope from the posterolateral corner in the knee and um, visualize the posterolateral impression. And also in these cases, in most cases, it can be done arthroscopically with cannulated um, screw, elevated, and then you see here a nicely reduced and well-fixed posterolateral impression fracture. That's the, the arthroscopic um, technique. We also published clinical results, 20 patients examined after 18 months. 14 hamstrings, all of them had an ACL rupture plus a posterolateral rim impression of the posterolateral corner. And um, we saw in the follow-up a free range of motion of almost all patients, um, objective and subjective stable um, ACLs. The KDC score was um, almost 80, VAS pain 1.1, no re-rupture. And most of the patients, all, all of the patients were satisfied with their result. So if the fractures are more complex, as you see in this case, it's also a postlateral 
tibia plateau fracture with a central um, impression. Um, as you see here, if the fractures are more complex and here PCL is also involved and um, medial side and the tibial um, spine here has also tibial eminentia has also an involvement. We strongly recommend to do an open surgery. So this needs a posteromedial um, plate for the big fragment here of the posteromedial side. You see here it's an entire condyle, more type two entire condyle and an additional lateral plate um, for the fixation or the depression of the of the lateral side, and um, as you see this in this case, if we classify tibial plateau fractures, there are multiple classification systems. We usually use the AO systems, AO system, and you um, you see here. On the left side, AO type B and type C fractures. And we additionally classified this um, one plane classification um, with a second plane classification. This is the axial classification, um, which gives us an idea where the fracture is and which approach we have to choose. I will come on to this topic later on. And we saw that in B-type fracture, in around two thirds, the PLC, the postolateral central segment here is involved, including the postolateral corner, the whole postolateral quadrant is very often involved. And in C-type fractures, this postolateral central segment, which is also called by my friend, um, Kong Feng Lu from China, the dark side of the knee, because it's difficult to visualize this, through an approach or also by fluoroscopy. Um, this is the dark side of the knee and this is the most fractured segment in C-type um, fractures. So this is a tibial plateau fracture and I just want to give you an idea about our approach strategy. Um, we always use or it's our concept to use the a direct approach to the fracture and a stepwise extension as needed. If I don't need an extension of the approach, we don't do it. But we always have to take in mind or to keep in mind that if we get desperated during the surgery and we were not able to do an anatomic um, reduction of the fracture, we should be able to extend the approach. If we use this case, the main fracture is here on the anterolateral side. If you use an anterolateral approach, as you see here, this is um, a typical enter anterolateral approach. And um, you usually can address all the anterior segments, as you see here, in the greenish color. All these segments can be, can be achieved. And you see here the yellow line. This is the area where you can, can easily put plates or locate plates for fixation. But you already see in, in, in uh, supine position, it's very difficult to put posterior plates on the tibial plateau. So in this case, we did an open reduction. The plate is already in situ. You see, we don't see very much of the fracture. So we did an, an osteotomy of the lateral epicondyle. We did an extension of the approach by osteotomy of the lateral epicondyle. We subluxated the lateral meniscus. This is the lateral meniscus. We just have to incise the meniscal capsular fibers at this area, which is lateral to the um, popliteus tendon. And only these two centimeters, if we cut these um, uh, meniscal um, popliteal and meniscal tibial fibers, then the meniscus can easily be subluxated and get a huge view in the whole tibial plateau with a nice visualization of the whole plateau. But nevertheless, the problem is the postolateral corner, the dark side of the knee, also the fixation and um, reduction and fixation of the postolateral corner. The anterior part can be nicely visualized in supine position. So I just wanted to show with this case that with an anterolateral approach, it's very difficult to address posterolateral segments. Um, and so you need specific approaches as we published in, in multiple publications. 
if you put the patient in a prone position, you can visualize these all these segments in prone position, laying in prone position. These segments can be visualized. And also you can put plates in these areas of the yellow line. This is the complete difference between the patient in supine position or prone position. Prone position opens a lot of advantages, but you also have some disadvantages. It's very difficult to address these segments in prone position. So this is a, a fracture. Um, if you remember this picture, this is very difficult to address in prone position. These areas can be nicely addressed, visualized. Greenish color and yellow color is the placement of the plates. So if you have such a fracture, this is um, intact. This is not broken. Though this anteromedial column of the tibial plateau is intact, the rest is broken. So to visualize and to fix this, for me, um, following the concept of direct approach to the fracture, direct visualization and fixation, extension as needed. For me, this is a very typical case, lateral comminuted, medial split to do this patient in prone position to a posteromedial and a posterolateral approach, which I will show you later on. This was um, done in a live surgery at the German Society, um, German Orthopedic and Trauma Society. So this was done in a live surgery. And um, so we fixed it. Everything was done in prone position. We started with the posteromedial side, did some um, screws, some compression screws at the lateral um, side and the posterolateral side, and then fixed the lateral um, tibial plateau, did an open reduction. And you see here an extended approach with the osteotomy of the lateral epicondyle. I will show it later on in a video of the osteotomy of the lateral epicondyle. Then you get a good view in the tibial plateau. And this is the intraoperative um, 3D scan, shows a nicely reduced um, tibial plateau, um, anatomic reduction, and the plates are in the best position um, um, where the screw, it, where the plate can buttress the fragment and the screws are perpendicular to the fracture lines. So for a postulateral approach, let's come to the approaches and the technique of the approaches. That was the, our concept. And now I come to the approaches. We published 2010 this postulateral approach. I will show you also a video right now, which is an approach where we go to the postulateral corner or address the postulateral corner of the tibia plateau, usually with a small plate um, medially to the um, perineal nerve, which is here, which should be um, protected, very important. And it's a kind of a technique of a, um, a two-window approach. We have two windows. It's a lateral window and a postlateral window with one skin incision. I will show you right now. These are intraoperative views. The postlateral tibial plateau can be nicely seen but to get a good view intra-articular, you probably are only able to see the last 25%, 20, 25% of the articular surface with this approach, with the postulateral window. If you want to see more, you have to extend the approach. This postulateral approach can be also attended by an epicondyle osteotomy, which I will show you um, later on. So, this is um, a video, the first video um, for um, the lateral window. You see, this is the lateral window, one skin incision. This is the fibular head um, and one skin incision over the fibular head. This is the biceps tendon. What you see here, it's not the iliotibial band, it's the biceps tendon. Iliotibial band is uh, much more anteriorly. And you have a lateral window and a postolateral window. And um, this is what you see during surgery. This is a postolateral impression fracture, as you see here. So this fracture is um, elevated with um, whatever device you, you like to use. I like a, a respiratory, um, for example, but you also can do it with a chisel. So this can be elevated nicely by the lateral window. But you see already it's difficult to fix this with a lateral, um, with a lateral plate. So it's much better to come from postolateral through the postolateral window, one skin incision, two windows again. This is the approach we described 
And then you can see here, posterolateral, you can nicely put in a screw, for example, or a small plate to fix this posterolateral um, fragment. So this is um, the fracture here. You see this um, fracture, it's um, posterolateral fracture, additional posterior medial um, fracture. So opening lateral joint, expose one skin incision. Skin incision is directly um, performed um, above the fibula. This is the lateral epicondyle of the femur. What you see on the, on the left side, and then um, we open the fascia, expose the parallel nerve, protect the parallel nerve. And then we usually easily come down to the articular surface and the posterolateral tibial plateau. Um, as you see, the, the hook is under the meniscus. The meniscus is elevated. And then the, with the forceps, we are directly at the posterolateral tibial plateau. And um, and can this um, can uh, reduce it from this position and fix it? Put whatever instruments through this posterolateral window and um, elevate it, fix it with screw or a small plate. I recommend to use only a small plate, not long plates in this area, just small plates, three four centimeters long, um, just to to get some buttress um, of the fragments, as you see here, and in this case, additional posteromedial plate because there was also a postromedial fracture. This is a video which um, shows you, it takes, takes two minutes, which shows you nicely, probably, hopefully, um, the, the both approaches, the postromedial and the postolateral approach. This is um, a tibial plateau fracture. You see here, postolateral central, both posterior columns are fractured, anterior column is completely intact, so for us, prone position and fix the posterior parts of the tibial plateau. This is um, the right leg. This is our approach, um, usually directly over the fibula head, most cases a little bit more anteriorly. And we open up the fascia, you already see the perineal nerve directly um, at the end of the biceps tendon. This is the gastrocnemius. And underneath the gastrocnemius, we go under the gastrocnemius and then we already see the um, neurovascular bundle. This is the neurovascular bundle. What you see here, um, it, it lies on the popliteus. That's the popliteus here. And it goes under the soleus. And this is the uh, soleus um, here. Uh, we have to detach the soleus muscle a little bit from the fibula head to come down to the posterior tibial plateau. This is arteria genicularis lateralis inferior and can be coagulated. Now this see the popliteus muscle and popliteus muscle is elevated. And then you see the posterior lateral tibial plateau and the fracture. And with this posterior lateral window, you can reduce it. Then we create an additional lateral window with one approach in prone position, lateral window, osteotomize lateral epicondyle, because in this case, we don't see very nice the, the articular surface. Now we get a better exposure of the articular surface after osteotomy. So we fix it under 100% visual control with K wires, as you see here, and um, put in some um, compression screws at first. This is what I like to do, especially at the posterolateral side. I usually make two compression, compression screws and then Plate is introduced in the TPLS anterior compartment, as you see here. And then um, it's additionally fixed with a plate. And in this case, additional posteromedial approach. Usually I start with the posteromedial side, but I just wanted to show it's also possible to start with posterolateral. It doesn't matter. I start with posteromedial. It, um, it's only possible to expose it a little bit. This is um, the um, semi-membranosus tendum has to be um, to be saved. Don't detach the post um, the semi-membranosus tendon, and then you easily can put a plate on the posterior medial side and fix the fracture. Then percutaneous screws um, to the shaft, as you see here, and refixation of the lateral epicondyle. Um, with usually two screws, in most cases without washer, only if osteoporotic bone, then we use an additional um, washer. And then you see the knee is stable again, 
And you also see that it's not possible anymore to get a visualization of the reduced fracture. It's difficult to see the fracture. And this is the X-ray here. And you see very nicely anatomic reduction of the fracture, perfect reduction, um, osteoporotic bone, no doubt, but very nicely um, reduced in this case and fixed with two plates in prone position with a posteromedial and a posterolateral approach. Um, oh, we have to stop, sorry. Okay. This is another example. This is unfortunately, um, that was um, 10 years ago. Um, that was the time when we developed this approach um, and got some first experiences with this approach. And this is unfortunately my neighbor. <laughs> she is 64 years old, osteoporotic. So the question was arthroplasty, primarily arthroplasty or osteosynthesis. And um, for her, it was clear to do an osteosynthesis. She did not want to have an arthroplasty. And also I preferred by myself in this case, um, an osteosynthesis. So um, we did an osteosynthesis with a in prone position, postromedial and postlateral approach. And um, this is how we treated um, her. And now this is um, 10 years ago. And again, she's my neighbor and she's still doing fine. I have night, nice weekends when I see, see her with her, with her dog and she's still um, doing very fine 10 years later. So this was again, postromedial and postlateral approach, additionally lateral window for the big plate and the small, smaller plates through the postlateral window and the postromedial approach. This is also um, a case example. This is a kind of a Moore, yeah, it's not, not really a Moore type two, it's a little bit more, but I would not say it's a Moore type five. So sometimes with this Moore classification, I have my problems because not all patients fit in this type one to five. Um, from the functional aspect, this is a Moore type two. So it's a almost entire, almost entire condyle, posteromedial, and she has a huge posterolateral impression. It's the whole plateau. The post, the, the lateral column is intact. Posterolateral plateau is depressed. And we also have um, a bony avulsion of the ACL and the PCL. So what have we done in this case? These are also cases more type two. We do in prone position and usually start with a posteromedial approach. Okay, so take a look at the first picture, posteromedial approach, posteromedial reduction, posteromedial plate. Okay, then we did address the PCL, the bony PCL with some screws, fixed it with some screws. And then we elevated the posterolateral plateau as you see here and fixed and elevated that with some um, elevated it, put some bone graft underneath and fixed it just from posteromedial and percutaneously from lateral um, with some screws, as you see here. And um, what we also did is uh, we call it Robin Hood shot for the bony ACL avulsion. So we usually go in with a with a with an ACL aiming guide, TPL ACL um, aiming guide go from posterior between ACL and PCL. We go through from posterior to anterior, hook in the bony fragment, reduce the fragment from posterior, and then through the guide, we, sh we um, drill in two K wires for cannulated screws, and we fix it then with a, with a um, drill guide placed in, in, um, in C2 to fix the ACL. We, um, drill in two guide wires for cannulated screws, and then we retrograde, fix it with two screws. This was performed in this case, as you see here. And I would say in 50% of the cases, the bony ACL avulsion can be fixed with, um, with screws from posterior in a prone position. In 50% of the cases, we have to turn around the patient and fix the ACL through a small incision from anterior. But in this case, it worked very nicely. And the patient did very, very well um, over the time and it healed perfectly. Let me say some words about 
3D printing and the influence of 3D printing um, on the quality of treatment of tibial plateau fractures. We observed um, in this study, we, we examined whether students, young residents, experienced consultants, um, these three groups, um, we observed or e examined um, how people feel when they have an additional 3D print model of the tibial plateau fracture. How good can they classify and how often do they change their treatment plan um, when they have an additional model on the table? And we also asked them in a questionnaire how helpful that was and what did it step by step. We did a first CT scan, showed them the CT scans, answered, um, asked them to classify the fracture. Then we did a, um, a 3D um, CT, um, showed them, take, took a look what did what it improve, did they classify the fractures different, and then at the end they got additionally. Um, got a um, 3D printed model of the fracture. And then we were asked all the questionnaire again to classify the fracture, how would they position the fracture, what approach. And so what we found out is that um, we were able to get a, a high reliability um, in the diagnostic setting with an additionally, um, with an additional 3D printing and especially the positive haptic feedback was very helpful for surgeons this is what we as surgeons can imagine because if they have that if anyone even experienced surgeon have the chance to get a 3d printed model of the fracture in their hands they have a much better feeling they do a better classification they were able um, um, to um, in, in 36 percent of the cases they treated their their treatment um, plans they improved the patient's posi position the positioning during surgery they um, did another choice of approaches so in around 36 percent they changed their plans to manage these fractures when they had the additional information of a 3d printed model and the surgeons felt much more secure there is one thing you also, also should um, take a look at or should be aware. If you do posterolateral lateral um, um, in, uh, approaches on the knee, there is one real danger. And this is the area where the trifurcatio here is, where the arterial tibialis anterior comes out of the um, popliteal artery. In this area, the artery or the anterior branch is fixed by the membrana interosseus. So it's not flexible. The, the um, popliteal artery here is very flexible. You can, you can um, put a hook on it, um, take it three or four centimeters to the medial or the lateral side, whatever. It's very, very flexible. At this area, there is absolutely no flexibility in the, in the artery and especially also not in the veins. So that is the area where you easily can injure um, the, the, the vein, especially the vein, also the artery. And this is usually from the articular surface down around five centimeters in average. So five centimeters distally to the articular surface, you have a danger. So if you use plates at the posterolateral corner, I strongly recommend to use plates which have a length not longer than three or four centimeters, not five centimeters. This is a dangerous area where I recommend not to use or to put a plate. On the posteromedial side, it's easy. Nothing is there, no artery, no nerve. So you can go down with a, with a plate until the ankle. But here it's dangerous, so keep that in mind. Another thing which might be also important for you to know is um, that we have um, here, um, we examined the bone density um, of the tibial plateau. And you see in the upper row, 
um, osteoporotic bone in the lower row, uh, a healthy bone of young volunteers. If you take a look at the young, at the young persons here, um, you see it's uh, CT scans, micro CTs. You see that the first centimeter beneath the articular surface provides us with very stable bone. So I strongly recommend to put screws of the plate or sing, single, uh, single screws directly underneath the articular surface, if possible, in the first centimeter of the tibial vertebra. If you have elderly people with osteoporosis, you have to be with your screws really close to the articular surface because um, the bone quality is really low and you all only has a, have a stable bone directly underneath the articular surface. So in osteoporotic bone, you have to even come closer to the articular surface to get stable fixation of your bone. My last issue um, of my talk is if you do a postulateral approach, please do it in the right way. Number one is on the left side, this patient um, had an had a exposure of the peroneal nerve from a neurosurgeon. And the neurosurgeon made the incision directly at the area where he expected the peroneal nerve, did not take care about the crease here in the popliteal fossa. So stay away from this crease, go lateral or medial um, with your approach to this crease, or if you want to go directly through in the, foss in the fossa popliteal through this crease, you have to be really parallel to the crease with a lazy S and come up. If you do this kind of S, you are too steep. You cross too steeply the, the crease. And um, this took, um, in this patient, it took four months until the wound healed because it opened up always again, had a big scarring in the popliteal fossa with a lot of problems. You see after four months still the crutches was not done by me. Um, this is not a good approach. The approach should start a little bit more anteriorly, um, as you see here in the in the tibial vertebra, and also should cross the um, the crease here really, really parallel, and then outside the popliteal fossa, it could be extended proximal or distal, but never go perpendicular or in a in a sharp angle um, over the crease here in the popliteal. For some. So my conclusion, um, to come to the end of my talk, the indication to operate a postulateral um, impression for us up to now with the current knowledge we have, especially biomechanical knowledge. Um, if the lateral meniscus, the posterior of the lateral meniscus, if is supported less than less than 50%, by the tibial plateau and the depression of the lateral tibial plateau is more than two millimeters. We um, strongly recommend um, to fix that, to elevate it, especially if the ACL is ruptured. If the ACL is intact, you can think about whether this is an indication or whether you should, um, um, should make the indication um, for surgery um, a little bit, the level a little bit higher. The surgical treatment option, options are arthroscopic control reduction and percutaneous fixation and tail tension. Usually we do this if it's only a, a simple postulateral rim fracture with a cannulated ankle rim um, and fix it with screws, arthroscopic reduction and percutaneous fixation. Um, if additional additional um, or if the, the fracture is a little bit more complex at the lateral side, we do an, an extended arthroscopic approach. That means we put the arthroscope um, in with a postulateral um, portal. You have to be a little bit more experienced, especially in arthroscopic surgery, to do a postulateral um, approach. But it is um, it is possible, and you get a really nice view with a postulateral um, window or with a postulateral arthroscopic approach to the postulateral tibial plateau and can nicely fix it under arthroscopic um, control. In complex fractures, complex postulateral involvement, um, especially 
when both segments are involved or the whole posterolateral quadrant is involved, depressed, comminuted, whatever, we strongly recommend to do an open approach um, in most cases and to do really a nice um, fixation. The posterolateral corner, I hope I could show you, is a really important uh, um, corner for the stability of the knee joint. For us, it's always the concept of direct approach to the fracture and stepwise extension as needed. And the reduction and fixation techniques are, um, I did not address this um, um, in special in this talk, but um, we do it similar as we learned it and in the AO principles and master courses and um, as it is propagated by AO. Thank you very much. That was my presentation. I'm very open um, to question and, um, and I hope that you could enjoy um, this talk and maybe get some more German perspectives um, to, to India. And um, I'm also um, very happy to hear um, Indian comments to this concept. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor for this classic presentation. Thank you, Professor, for the classic presentation with detailed uh, case examples. Thank you very much. Uh, professor, a few questions. Uh, professor, uh, in your classic post approach, you did not do a fibular osteotomy, right? Instead, you did a epicondylar osteotomy when required. Is there any situation where you have done a fibular osteotomy? Because there is a, another group of surgeons who do the fibular osteotomy, right? So um, if you have done, <clears throat> very good question. So in very much cases, I don't need fibular osteotomy and I don't need um, epicondyl osteotomy. But if in case it's a really comminuted fracture, I get desperated during surgery, I don't see it very nicely, I cannot reduce it um, very well. So I have to open it even more. So I do an osteotomy and extend the approach. Both is possible, fibular osteotomy and epicondyl osteotomy. If you have done, like me, a couple of, I did really a lot of fibular osteotomies and also a lot of epicondyle osteotomies. So the thing is the epicondyle osteotomy is much easier. It's much more forgiving. It's easier to fix. It's quicker in surgery. So if you have done both, I assume you would choose the epicondyle osteotomy because it's quicker and easier. The fibular osteotomy is a high trauma. You are always um, it, you are always surprised how many ligaments you have to release around the fibular head, how stable the fibular head is even after osteotomy. Very surprising. So it's a really great soft tissue damage. The nerve is not far away. Um, so it's also, I think, easier to injure a nerve. I, I never had, had an, an, a nerve injury in a tibial plateau fracture, but nevertheless, it can, it can happen. And, and also, and this is probably the key point, in my experience, the softest bone in the body is the fibular head. Even in young people, the fibular head is really soft. And I always think how to fix the fibular head best. And a dislocation, a secondary dislocation of the fibula head is not seldom. So I would ask the question back, why would you choose the fibula head if you have the chance to osteotomize lateral epicondyle? The visualization is the same. And the fixation is much easier when you use the, um, femoral, uh, the femoral epicondyle than the fibula head. But nevertheless, if you are used to extend your approach with a, with a fibula osteotomy, it's also fine, you know, it's, it's, it's possible, it's a good working horse, it, it works. Um, but for me, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. And so if ever possible, I always go, not in life, but in surgery, the easier way. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor. And Professor, the other important area is the positioning of the patient while doing a tibial plateau fractures. Now, in your cases, you have shown the prone position. 
Whereas some surgeons, they would like to do a floppy lateral. So what has yeah. been your experience? Absol absolutely fine. If you do a floppy lateral, it's also great and, and perfect. Um, for me, um, I... I cannot, I cannot tell you why I like it more to have the patient in prone position. Um, it's very seldom that I have to turn around the patient. So I don't need the floppy position when I have the patient in prone position. For me, it's a little bit more um, stable. The floppy position has for me one disadvantage. My 3D card in the brain gets confused when the leg is not fixed. When the leg turns, it's sometimes difficult to really get an idea where I really at the moment or at that second during the surgery, um, at exact what position am I if the leg is, is, um, is, is in a floppy position. So I like to have it more or I prefer it to have the leg in a more stable position where I always know or my 3D card in the brain always know where I am. And in a knee is a... Is, a lot of structures on the knee, you know, you can be quickly go wrong ways. It's very, very easily. So I prefer the um, not floppy position, but it's also possible, no doubt, if you're an experienced surgeon to do the surgeries, all the surgery I have see, I have shown in a floppy position, no, no problem. Thank you very much, Professor. Professor, we are also joined by Dr. Loy al Khatib. Uh, Loy is an uh, orthopedic surgeon based in Dubai. Lai, welcome to the show. Any questions to Professor Frosch, please? Hi, thanks. Thanks a lot for the comprehensive presentation. One of the most talk, I think, that covered all the points about uh, tibia plateau fractures. Thanks a lot again. One one question I think that our one point we, we might need to add is when you do the osteotomy, the medial lateral epicondyl osteotomy, that might put a, um, an extra risk uh, for the knee to be stiff. I'm not sure if you agree with me or not. So there will be a stiffness or there will be a risk I, of stiffness after, after you do the osteotomy. I agree. One thing, yeah, one, one, one thing maybe to add, um, or one thing maybe we can uh, focus on, which side do you go first? If you have a bicolumn tibia plateau fracture, would you fix the medial side first when then go to lateral? Or would you go to lateral first, fish it out when it's simple, and buttress it with a, with, through the posterior medial side. What do you think about that? And the third one, sorry, the third one, I think there's the in-face in view for the TPA plateau fracture. I think who talked about um, the uh, Deutsche Kniegelenkgesellschaft. The in-face view for the CT 3D reconstruction was really helpful in understanding the pattern of the fracture. I think you talked about it. Uh, this is something to focus on as well. Yeah. Um, your third, your third question or remark, I fully agree. Um, it can be hel very helpful to get this um, classification of Deutsche Kniegesellschaft, where you have the segments and can address or can choose the approach according to the segments which are involved. Number one. Number two. Um, question. Um, um, it was the question um, prone position. What would you fix first, medial or lateral? You know, I usually, or in general, fix at first the easier side because then I can use the easier side as a reference for the for the more community side. And as you know, 90% of, of bicondylar tibial plateau fractures are much more difficult at the lateral side than the medial side. The medial side is in most cases a, a split a medial split, and so I usually start with the medial side and then go to the lateral side. But, you know, it doesn't matter too much. You also, if you are sure, you also can start with the lateral side. If you have the feeling the lateral side is the side where you step by step can build up your fracture, that might be also easier. So I, I prefer, although at the pylon, um, to start with the easier side to build up lengths, um, especially you get really the light lengths and the light the right height, and um, so it's it mainly I would say ninety percent it's the the medial side I start with, and the last I do agree. Uh, and and the last question was the stiffness, you know the stiffness I also one hundred percent agree, with every additional trauma you do to the knee. 
the, the chance you do, that you get some stiffness is even higher. That's clear. But let me say two, two, two arguments. Number one is the word desperation. When you never get desperate during surgery and you always do well, you don't need extended approach. But, you know, I sometimes get really desperate in this horrible, sometimes really horrible comminutions. And I try always to give my best. And I think, I think it's better to open the fracture or to, to expose the articular surface with an extended approach to be as, as good or as anatomic as possible. And sometimes you have to open. So the, the bigger the approach, the higher is the scarring. But let me say one, one second thing to that kind. If you are really um, experienced knee surgeon and also have um, arthroscopic skills, we have seen that an early arthroscopic arthrolysis is very helpful and brings a lot of, especially these tibial plateau fractures, back to normal range of motion. So, and we also saw that the ideal time point for an arthroscopic arthrolysis is the time between months three and six. After six months, the results are a little bit um, worse, not much, but a little bit worse. And after 12 months, they are significantly worse when you wait 12 exactly. months. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's a, a good tool also in knee dislocations, we very, very have a very, very low indication level to do arthroscopic arthrolysis um, between month three and six. If you do arthroscopic arthrolysis, the fracture should be grossly healed. That's, that's very Agreed. important. Yeah, my aim is to do the arthroscopic arthrolysis, to be honest, within three months. So when, once I feel that patient is heading to stiffness, I will do immediately intervene with arthroscopic arthrolysis once the bone is healed. And uh, I, I won't let him uh, over three months. So I'll, uh, I will do that before three months. Other thing maybe we can add to uh, to, to increase the, uh, to, uh, the view or the exposure, the, adding the AO distractor. AO distractors, I find it is really helpful. And so you can add it and maybe maybe some save some osteotomy or save some uh, extended approach. Uh, during my fellowship in Canada, I, had, um, I did a orthopedic trauma fellowship and we used to use the air sacra, it was really helpful. And uh, we were sticking the scope in, uh, examine the joint itself, the joint separate after reduction. And uh, I think adding the air distractor, even though it's a bit old classic method, but I think it's still, still valid to use. Absolutely, the, the AO destructor is something I like. Um, we have two of them in, in our department because we use it very often. There is one difference in the pylon and the tibial plateau. This is my personal experience, but maybe you have other experiences. Um, in the pylon, the, the, the destructor is a sine qua non. So for me in the pylon surgery, the femur, we use usually the femur destructor, but you also can use the smaller destructor. Both are very helpful. So in the pylon, it's very helpful. And usually in the pylons, if you put in a destructor, you, in my experience, I never saw instability at the knee joint, especially at the medial, but also at the lateral side. If you put in on a destructor, especially at the medial side, if you put on a destructor and you really distract, you might have some remaining instability. That was my personal feeling. I haven't done a study about that. So good point. I'm yep. a little bit more cautious with the femur destructor at the tibial plateau. But that is just a personal um, feeling. It's you know, it's more a surgeon's feeling or surgeon's experience. I haven't examined um, that. But awesome. I agree, pylon 100%, tibia plateau, sometimes yes. But if I have the feeling I get too much tension, I put it, take it away and do an, an, an osteotomy. Awesome. awesome. Thanks a lot uh, for the great presentation. Thank you. I'm looking much, forward professor. to meet you in yeah. person as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor. I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for this classic presentation. And I'm sure this is going to reach to a lot of people all over the world. Thank you very much. It was a, a great pleasure, much. also a honor um, to be with you, and um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Greetings to India and Dubai.